They undergo a truly epic journey, traveling thousands of miles throughout their lives. And from the moment they emerge from the gravel, they navigate a gauntlet of predators. They display remarkable endurance and athleticism on their final journey to the spawning grounds. And in their spawning areas, they sacrifice their health and eventually their lives in order to reproduce. In life and death, salmon overcome tremendous obstacles to survive. And they're the topic of today's live chat. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature camp network. And joining me today is Ranger Brooklyn White from Katmai National Park. Brooklyn, it's so great to speak with you again. Yes, thank you so much for having me here with you. Both uh, Brooklyn and I are fascinated by salmon and we love sharing our knowledge of salmon and learning more about these creatures. So I think we have a, a fascinating uh, conversation planned ahead uh, for you. And before we get into the main body of that, I do want to throw out a plug uh, for uh, a survey that I would like uh, Bear Cam viewers to participate in. You can find a link for that in the featured comment at the below the live camera page right now. Uh, many of you may have taken that survey last year, but the research team that I am working with, including uh, researchers from East Carolina University uh, and Bates College in, in Maine, and also with the National Park Service are interested in your experience this summer So, because so many things have changed uh, across the world this year. So if you can take a few minutes to take out or to, to open that survey and participate, that would be absolutely wonderful. But of course, like I said before, we're talking about uh, salmon today, Brooklyn, and they're a fascinating and a tremendously important group of animals. Uh, and the way I, I look at fish, especially when we look at Katmai's ecosystem overall, is that um, they the, the survival of Katmai's ecosystem really is uh, is is tied to, to these fish. Um, in a lot of ways, um, we can consider them to be the, the keystone of Katmai. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I totally agree. And especially when we describe a species as keystone, that puts a lot of weight on, on their shoulders. Um, you know, when we use the word keystone in architecture, we typically refer to the stone that is placed at the very top of an arch. And it's the stone that provides the support for that arch to be able to stand structurally. And so that's a really great illustration for the importance of salmon in um, the Katmai ecosystem and specifically as we look at the Brooks River. Um, the salmon truly are integral into creating um, a healthy ecosystem. But to get a better idea of how the salmon are so connected, we wanna start at the beginning of, of their life story. So life for a salmon begins as an egg. Um, it's deposited into a shallow nest in a gravel bed and then incubated for about 90 to 150 days. Um, ultimately, they will hatch into the larval state known as alevin. Um, and they have a dense, rich egg sac that is full of nutrients that will help them grow into hardy fry like we're looking at here. Um, during this time, they still stay pretty close to that gravel bed um, for protection and safety. Um, but then they will begin to emerge, still clinging to the root systems along the river um, and covered areas that are still going to provide some of that additional protection from predators. And then over the next year um, into the spring, they will begin to slowly make their way out into um, Knack Knack Lake when we're thinking about the Brooks River system. And they'll typically stay even in that um, lake for an additional year or two as they're growing, um, gaining nutrients again before they prepare to make their way out into the ocean. Um, they're slowly getting used to higher densities of salt in the water. Um, and what's really special about salmon is that they are anadromous, meaning that they can survive in both fresh water and salt water. So as they make their way, their smolt bodies are beginning to um, go through that transition, allowing them to survive in the salt water. Now, as they make their way out to sea and begin to feed on the abundant zooplankton and um, algae that is found in the oceans, um, they are going to grow exponentially. Now, they typically stay out in um, the ocean waters or sockeye for two to three years as they continue to grow before making their way back to 
the fresh water systems, their natal streams and rivers. During this time, um, as they're growing, they're faced with so many different predators. They never really know what they're going to expect, but they could encounter seals or sharks, um, seabirds, even humans are another predator that they are faced with along their journey back to um, begin the spawning process. And then once they get to the river, we know that they're going to be encountering all sorts of bears that are wanting to utilize their, their nutrients um, to survive and make it through hibernation. But once the salmon have made it to um, the fresh water, their body begins another process, um, the spawning process. They stop eating and they begin to um, actually use the nutrients that they have stored over their time while at sea um, to make their way to their um, natal spawning grounds, often within inches of where they, they themselves were deposited as an egg. Um, so it's really a spectacular process as they make their way back. Um, you then begin to see the females. They are finding a location that they think is going to be ideal for their red or that shallow nest that is dug in the gravel. Um, they will use their tail to dig out that um, little nest. And then once the female is ready to deposit her eggs, a male will come alongside her. And as she deposits her eggs, he will then fertilize with his milt um, to then allow those eggs to hopefully be successful. And they may do this a few more times in that same proximity to the original red um, until they're both exhausted. They don't have anything left to give. And then the finale of this life cycle is that the female will stay by that nest to guard and protect it until she uh, can't do it anymore, until she is exhausted. I mean, we've even seen standing along um, the platforms, seeing a female salmon that is just right there along the nest. She's not even upright anymore, just trying to protect as long as she can until ultimately she sacrifices her life um, to provide those nutrients to that gravel, rich gravel bed that will then um, help those alevin and the fry to be successful before they make their way out to the waters. So it's a really spectacular life cycle, um, how they continue to work to provide the best they can um, and cycle back through. But Mike, do you think you can give us a better perspective of what it looks like specifically along the Brooks River? Yes, I, 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 when I look at the salmon, I, I always marvel at their perseverance and their endurance because of many of the factors that you uh, just introduced us to. Uh, and the, the timing of their, their run through the Brooks River and elsewhere is also you know, another part of that, that fascinating process. Uh, and it underscores really how, how well adapted they are to, to many of these ecosystems where, where they inhabit. With with salmon, you know, each each stock or each population of salmon uh, has is adapted and evolved to run at a certain time, run upstream, enter freshwater at a certain time of the year. In many warmer climates, where salmon, Pacific salmon, are found, like in California, for instance, a lot of their their runs are are wintertime runs. So that's when the water temperatures are cooler. That's when more water is running through a lot of the rivers that they use to navigate towards their spawning grounds and spawn within. But that's it's different in uh, most of Alaska, and it's it's different, especially in Bristol Bay, where the majority of the fish that enter uh, freshwater come really with our sockeye salmon. What we're seeing right now at Brooks Falls, the majority of those fish come within a very brief window of time, late June, and the first couple weeks of July. It's a remarkable wave of salmon. I mean, it's a wall of fish unlike any other on the planet. Last year. There was something like 56 million sockeye salmon that um, came back to Bristol Bay, if you count the fish that were caught in the commercial fishery and the number of fish um, that escaped upstream to spawn and sustain the run. And that comes on the heels of a monstrous run, a record sized run of over 62 million fish in, in 2018. So Bristol Bay and its salmon populations are very, very healthy right now. 
and the, eighty percent of these fish come back within like a two week period. I mean, it is it is an amazing wall of fish that shows up. And right now we're in the midst of that migration period. So that's what we're witnessing on the bear cams right now. Just um, mm -hmm. huge pulses or waves of fish entering Brooks River from time to time. And there, uh, so there are some are migratory species coming back into freshwater ecosystems. Their spawning activity, though, Brooklyn, it, it varies quite a bit. It uh, it depends on where those fish are going in the watershed. If you're going to uh, spawn in a small stream, typically in Katmai, you're going to do it starting around midsummer. That's really where the first spawning activity occurs in small tributary waters, like at the head of Lake Brooks, for instance, or the head of Naknek Lake and some other places, because a lot of those streams are are fed by uh, by upwelling uh, groundwater springs. It tends to keep the water temperature pretty cold. But Brooks River, in Brooks River, we see this wave of fish move through, but we don't actually see spawning in Brooks River until late summer. Brooks River tends to be a bit warmer on average than a lot of those headwater streams because it's fed by Lake Brooks. And Lake Brooks isn't something that we can see on the cameras, unfortunately, but it is a, a very large lake. And it, um, since Brooks River is the outlet of Lake Brooks, the river itself tends to be a little bit warmer. And water temperature, for the most part, is the factor that determines incubation period for the salmon eggs itself. So if a salmon were to start to spawn in Brooks River right now, its eggs might incubate um, too quickly and hatch at the wrong time of the year, come out, uh, come, out of, uh, come out of the red early and all of a sudden find no food available because it's, it's early winter or something like that. So they, they time their spawning very precisely to take advantage of the water conditions. And one question that we also get to kind of related to um, how salmon are using Brooks River is just how many salmon use Brooks River. Yeah. And, and we don't really know. Uh, unfortunately, no one's out there counting the number of fish that move into Brooks River. Uh, but in the past, uh, there, there used to be a weir uh, at the head of, of Brooks, River, Brooks River. And if you're not familiar with what a weir looks like, it's basically uh, just a, a line of poles or sticks strung across a stream. And it's impassable to fish, except for like in a very small section. So what you can do is you can open up, uh, you know, part of that weir, and you can either capture the fish or count them. And the fisheries biologists mm -hmm. were interested in studying the uh, the dynamics of the sockeye salmon uh, in the Brooks River area in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and they had a, a weir at the head of the river. So they were counting fish, not capturing them, but counting them, and they found that um, the, no uh, the the number of fish that moved through Brooks River was about 20 percent of the overall escapement or the number of fish that that swim into the Naknek River watershed. So if we get a million fish into the Naknek River watershed, which we've already exceeded this year, we can expect to see 200,000 fish moving into Brooks River. And we and um, you know the numbers of salmon keep growing uh, overall in, in Bristol Bay. And and the bears as as we've seen on the cameras Brooklyn are are very fat and uh, and quite well fed right now. Uh, what about those direct ecological impacts? I mean, the bears are kind of like the obvious one. How does uh, the number of fish, this wave of fish moving into the watershed, affect uh, bears and their and their populations here in Katmai? Yeah, I think especially along the Brooks River, they have such a, a really beautiful relationship, um, resulting in hefty bears um, that are just really, really successful. We see, especially with sows bringing back multiple cubs per litter, um, which we don't see everywhere. Seeing that density um, regularly is really, really special. Um, and then across Katmai as a whole, this means that bears are going to do really well. They're going to have so many opportunities to um, put on that fat for hibernation um, later in the year. Um, Brooks River provides a very unique experience in Katmai, uh, but as a whole, our bears are going to do very well um, just because of having such a rich, dense resource in the fat from that salmon, as well as other marine um, food sources. What else is just so special is just the density of bears that find themselves here. When we look at Katmai, we have about 2,200 bears um, across um, a very large area. But Brooks Camp will typically see about 60 bears, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the year. But in a you know two square miles of area, that is a lot of bears to be clinging to one food source, being the Brooks River. So it's a very special and unique relationship that we see with the bears and the salmon in this area. 
But it's not just the bears that we have, you know, the delight of watching utilize the river. Uh, I think very recently in the last couple of days, we had a really beautiful shot um, captured by the cams of a wolf utilizing the falls. Um, you know, over the last and few it was, years- It was back seen... this morning too. Oh, perfect. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> uh, but we've seen, you know, maybe a wolf or two utilize the river, but very rarely, if ever, have we ever seen a wolf fishing from the lip of the falls. Um, so that is very cool. And I even heard that there may have been three wolves at one time utilizing the the falls and right below the platform, um, which is something that is so special and spectacular. Again, getting to see this really keystone species um, providing for many different species that find themselves along the river. We also know that we have a dense population of migratory birds that come to utilize um, Alaska, but even Brooks and Katmai um, as a place that they are able to um, raise their young very early before they migrate back into um, you know, the Southern Hemisphere. So we have so many species that are utilizing um, this really important resource to provide for and to have successful um, family units. So I think it's really, really interesting just to see how um, the salmon continue to be seen um, and used from the cams. But could you share maybe some things that we don't get to see um, the impacts of directly? The, you know, we can think of salmon really as a, a, a bundle of energy that gets transferred throughout, you know, the ecosystem through a variety of ways. And as you as you spoke of uh, the obvious ways that salmon are transported through the ecosystem or, or benefit the ecosystem or through, you know, the food that they provide the bears and wolves. Uh, when we see salmon carcasses that are brought onto shore, like this one here, that are partially eaten, those are quickly recycled into the ecosystem. Uh, when I have the opportunity to stand at the platform at Brooks Falls, I love watching the bears, of course, and they garner most of my attention, but I also really enjoy looking at the little details. Um, so looking at the rest of the wildlife that are in the area, the birds, for instance, the insects that utilize uh, that spot. And sometimes I'll see, you know, these rotting salmon carcasses that are just covered in maggots, but I see birds visiting those salmon carcasses regularly. There have been instances, and I haven't been able to really see all that well, of uh, birds maybe picking salmon flesh, like songbirds I'm talking about, sparrows mm -hmm. picking salmon flesh off of uh, those carcasses. But a lot of times I see sparrows visiting those carcasses to pick off maggots. And they're filling their bills up with maggots to bring back to their nest. Mm -hmm. So those, again, the, the energy of that salmon is immediately transferred not just to bears, but throughout the throughout the ecosystem itself. There's a um, perhaps a uh, just as important, but a harder to trace way that that salmon are impacting the ecosystem overall, and that happens to be through their nutrients. Um, we can think of you know again salmon as a bundle of energy, but they're also a sack of fertilizer. Like you mentioned, uh, Brooklyn salmon go to the ocean to get big. That's where they're gaining most of their body mass. Something like 99% of their body mass is gained out in the open ocean. So when they're coming back into Bristol Bay, when they're coming back into these freshwater ecosystems each year, they're bringing back, uh, you know, it's it's tens of millions of fish each year and it's uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of fertilizer basically being brought back into these watersheds. And the the importance of those, uh, those, those nutrients and that fertilizer is a little bit harder to trace. But if we think about the characteristics of like an Alaskan lake, it's typically pretty cold and it's pretty uh, nutrient poor. It doesn't really have uh, a lot of free circulating nutrients to support things mm -hmm. at the base of the food chain, things like uh, algae and zooplankton. Uh, but when salmon come back into these watersheds and they're transporting all of that fertilizer along with them, that helps to boost the productivity of, of this ecosystem overall. And the vectors, mm -hmm. the ways that those things get transported throughout the ecosystem are the things that we can we can see fairly easily in a lot of cases. So the bears bringing that stuff up into the forest, bringing the carcasses up into the forest, depositing partially eaten carcasses where it can rot and decompose and fertilize the plants there, but also through their urine and scat. I mean, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. really important vector for bears to transport salmon nutrients throughout the watershed, much farther away from a stream, for instance, than they would normally carry a salmon carcass, because bears are typically eating those carcasses immediately. So they're only, you know, dragging them maybe a, a couple hundred yards away from the river at most. Usually they're eating it much closer to the river. And we know that salmon nutrients are important to the watershed through a growing body of scientific studies. 
there's uh, been evidence, uh, you know, really over the last 30 years that scientists are, are have, have gathered uh, to trace salmon nutrients throughout throughout the watershed, specifically using uh, isotopes of elements that are found in the ocean in, in higher concentrations, for instance. Uh, because you can find nitrogen, for example, on land, and you can find nitrogen in the ocean, but there's a higher percentage of a heavier isotope in the ocean, nitrogen 15, than on land. So scientists are able to to take or look for that isotope isolated in tissue samples of bears, for instance, bones of bears, mm -hmm. uh, even the leaves of plants. And if they're finding in these areas where salmon are running elevated levels of that nitrogen 15, and there's really only one pathway for that to get from the ocean to the land in large amounts, and that happens to be salmon. And overall, I mean, it, uh, many fisheries biologists are starting to think that this, this nutrient cycling that happens, the wave of fertilization that is brought into these freshwater ecosystems each year happen to be a, a positive feedback loop because it's not only important for the terrestrial plants and the terrestrial animals, but also the aquatic animals as well. Those small fry that we saw uh, clips of at the beginning and the, um, the ones that you spoke of living in fresh water, there they are, there, there they are again. This is footage from Brooks River uh, in, in June of a couple of years ago. Those, those tiny fry are feeding on uh, bits of plankton that are drifting in the water. They're, they're too small for me to see with the naked eye. But the, the nutrients that salmon provide and the fertilizer they provide to the watersheds each year are, uh, are, are, are helping the plankton to grow in abundance and become um, abundant for these, these small fry. So this really is like a positive feedback loop. Without large runs of salmon, it is, uh, you, you really don't have the food resources to support large numbers of salmon fry and eventually salmon smolts going mm -hmm. out uh, to sea. So those indirect impacts are, are really, really fascinating and another way that salmon really uh, underpin the ecosystem. Of course, Brooklyn, we, we have to consider, you know, the, uh, protecting salmon now in the future because uh, the survival of salmon in many ways is, is not guaranteed. And I think there are a couple of elephants in the room regarding salmon conservation. And one of the big ones that's on a lot of people's minds, of course, across the world happens to be uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's true. And there are so many things that we don't know about um, the natural effects versus human impacts that may be accelerating um, climate change. And so it's important for us to be aware and look at and look for evidence of how it may be affecting um, these really sensitive populations. Um, studies have been done, um, especially in regards to the warming of the oceans and how you know, we know how important the olfactory sense is for salmon. They utilize it as a way um, to return to their natal streams. They also use their olfactory senses to be able to um, pick up chemical cues in the water in an effort to sense danger if there's a predator around. Um, and so as we see ocean waters um, rise and studies that have been done through Washington University have mentioned and noted that as the temperature increases, it becomes harder to be able to utilize and focus those olfactory senses, which could result in more predation in the oceans. It could result in difficulty actually being able to return to those natal streams and pick up on those chemical cues. Um, so that's one effect that has been monitored over the last few years. Um, and then even into this last summer and seeing the um, increased temperatures of the water in the rivers and lakes at Brooks um, after we had, you know, a two week stretch of heat from the heat dome. Um, and that's not a natural temperature that we see, especially along southwestern Alaska. So to see the effects of that direct heat um, outside of just the temperatures oceanically climbing, you know, a degree or two every year, which one degree is significant. Um, so those are two examples of things that we've seen that we don't know what the impact of that could be, but at the same time, we see that there's evidence that that could be truly detrimental to potential populations. And regarding the, the uh, heat wave that we had last year, I actually went, um, into one of the online portals that the National Park Service 
uh, maintains for a lot of its information collected in national parks. I went through there this winter and I downloaded the data from some data loggers in Lake Brooks. And I also wrote to one of the biologists from the Southwest Alaska net network um, this winter to see if she had any information specific to the water temperatures in Brooks River. And at the head of the river, they actually had a temperature logger installed there. Mm -hmm. And it was last year um, during the peak of that heat wave, really at this time of the year. So like on July 8th last year, it was super hot yeah. at Brooks River. Everybody was sweating in, in t-shirts and shorts. Everyone's getting sunburned because no one expected. It was really unprecedented conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I say unprecedented, not just like hot, but like never before seen hot temperatures right. in that area. And the water temperature at the head of Brooks River at, um, at times reached like the upper 70s and, and low 80s. I mean, it was that's and that's that's incredibly high water temperatures for that area. Uh, it really and probably have never been experienced before. So definitely climate change is here right now uh, that 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 heat wave uh, is it may pretend some of the conditions in the future that I think a lot of uh, uh, salmon will experience. One mm -hmm. um, great thing about, um, you know, Katmai, though, Brooklyn, um, and, and you've seen, you know, this this watershed, you know, just as much as I, is that it's really diverse. So unlike yeah. watersheds, you know, in, in, in farther south that are really heavily impacted by human development, uh, the, the watershed in Katmai has a lot of large lakes where salmon can find refuge during those really mm -hmm. those really hot conditions. So what we saw last year is the salmon run just sort of like pausing and yeah. and and then running upstream when the water temperatures happen to be colder. So that yeah, climate change is definitely a thing that um, is a concern for our for our, our salmon populations in Bristol Bay. And it's certainly a concern for salmon populations farther south that are already really kind of on the brink of of extinction in many cases or, or their runs are just at historic lows compared to what they were just like 100 120 years ago and, and of course you know one other you know if i think there are you know i mentioned before there's maybe a couple of elephants in the room regarding salmon in bristol bay one of them happens to be climate change the other one happens to be a large-scale development over mm -hmm. um you know and especially over the last several years, um, there's there's been a uh, a plan, uh, a proposal to mine at the headwaters of Bristol Bay, um, and the waters where this mine would be located would not flow through Katmai National Park, but a lot of the sim similar habitat features it sort of exist uh, in in that area. Um, so the proposed pebble mine would be located at the at, at headwaters that run into the Quechac, um River in Lake Iliamna and also the Nushagak River. And those are two of Bristol Bay's uh, most productive salmon producing watersheds. And of course, you know, the, the mine proponents will say that um, they, ca they can do that and protect salmon. But we've, we've seen in the past that salmon runs are continuously sacrificed um, in the name of development. And the, the salmon really are the, uh, the keystone of not only our ecosystem in, in Bristol Bay, but also the culture of Bristol Bay going back mm -hmm. uh, thousands of years. So there's a very yeah. strong human history and cultural ties associated with, with salmon. Um, and, you know, pebble mine and large scale development is that other um, long term threat to, uh, to, to salmon in Bristol Bay. And honestly, you know, that's, um, if we can't protect salmon in Bristol Bay, I have to say, I mean, I don't know what we can protect. This is the last great run of salmon on yeah. earth. We've, we've lost these runs everywhere else. We don't have them in the Columbia anymore. Uh, we, you know, the Fraser river runs is under continuous stress from, from climate mm -hmm. change and development, stuff like that. So this is our one last chance, I think, to protect these, these large scale salmon runs. And I'm going to try to get to a couple of, of viewer questions. Um, in, in just a moment here, uh, but uh, Brooklyn, I would like to thank you for for joining me on the on the talk today. It's it's always fascinating yeah. to talk about salmon. I mean, the, the legacy of these fish they extend to nearly all life in Katmai. Uh, they're the first. They're they're the fish that transcend boundaries between the ocean and the land, really in ways that that organisms other organisms cannot do. And in this wounded world, I mean, this is a world. Where it is wounded, um, you know, by climate change and mass extinction, uh, you know, and Katmai National Park is an increasingly rare example of an ecosystem functioning at its at its full potential. 
And Bristol Bay and Katmai yeah. represent, like I mentioned, the last great salmon run on earth. It offers a stark contrast to, to runs outside of this area that are not doing so well and exist at fractions of their historic highs. Uh, but the, the, the survival of this ecosystem as we know it is, um, is not guaranteed. So we, are, we have to work now and in the future to protect these runs because without salmon, I mean, it's, it's really more than an aesthetic loss and an economic loss. It's, um, it's a loss uh, to our ecology. It's a loss to the bears. Without salmon, we wouldn't be able to watch bears at Brooks River because they'd have really no reason um, to visit and, and gather at Brooks River. No one would go to Brooks River to fish for trophy-sized rainbow trout because there wouldn't be enough food to support the growth uh, of trout to large sizes and there'd be very few trout in the ecosystem overall. And Brooks River would not have supported people nearly continuously for the past 5,000 years. All of these things are dependent <clears throat> on these fish. And I think because of their uncommon life history strategy and determination to, produce, to reproduce in the face of great challenges, um, we can admire these fish all the much more. And I think we owe it to ourselves and the future to try to try to protect them. And I think, um, Brooklyn, if you have uh, time, we do have a, a couple of questions in our queue that maybe we can get to. And also, I think yeah, we could provide a, a, okay, a, a quick update on the cub um, that people were watching last night. There was a cub last night, um, and I don't know very much. Um, Ranger Naomi knows more, um, but there was a cub last mm -hmm. night that ended up uh, stumbling, having uh, at, at the mouth of Brooks River, it had trouble keeping up with its mother. It swam through a grassy island, to make a long story short, and it died on that island. Uh, so the the MPS um, is right now kind of determining whether they should just collect it or um, and send it off for necropsy, or if they should just let nature take its course. So um, look for updates in the comments periodically on that. Once Ranger Naomi, who's at Brooks River, has more information, I'm sure she'll share that. But I wanted to throw that out um, quickly for everybody. Mm -hmm. But Brooklyn, um, you know, I've been I've been doing a lot of talking in the last five minutes or so. I want to give you a chance to to jump back in here. Um, one one person actually in, uh, was wondering, uh, you know, how big is a salmon in terms of length and weight? Uh, and that's something that we actually hadn't discussed during the chat. You know, most of the fish yeah. that come at the Bristol Bristol Bay are sockeye salmon, but can you give us an estimate on their on their size and weight overall? Well, um, it depends on male or female and our species but if we're talking about a sockeye they're not going to be the biggest salmon that we might find on the river um but typically if you're going to be you know finding a salmon let's see no this way it's going to fit in your hands pretty well <laughs> and you know it may be between five pounds that's a pretty solid size a pretty um common size if you're going to be finding a salmon along the river um, but they can definitely be larger as well um and if i think the qu question even compared to a wolf's size and the salmon is going to be significantly smaller than the wolf um, but as you can see it's still going to be a hearty meal um, that a wolf would be able to take advantage of um, so mike do you have any specific notes for um weight variance between a male and a female salmon? You know, I, I don't. Um, that's a good question. I have to look that up. And if anybody's really interested in that, you may want to, there's a couple of books that I, re that I reference all the time. One is a bit harder to find. It's out of print. You might be able to find it at your local library. It's called a Pacific Salmon Life Histories. It has a red jacket. Um, and it's written, I think the authors are Groot and um, Margolis, if I remember correctly. That book is that is kind of an amazing book from the early 90s that talks a lot about salmon life history strategies, goes through each of the North American species, um, and covers even um, a species of salmon that we don't find in North America um, called the Masu salmon that's found in Japan. So uh, you, can, you can take a look at that. And then a, a more recent um, book uh, that was a uh, second edition was published in 2018 is called The Behavior and Ecology of Pacific Salmon and Trout. Um, by Thomas Quinn, and he's a salmon biologist at the University of Washington. And that, that's, a, that's a wonderful book. You read that, you're going to have a, a tremendous understanding of, of salmon overall. Uh, but as far as males and females go, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a really great question. I know that um, eggs take up a significant portion of a female salmon's body weight, as much as 20%, mm -hmm. um, right before they spawn. 
So they're, I mean, they're, they're devoting a tremendous amount of energy to those salmon eggs. And I think that's why we see the bears often target the row out of, um, mm -hmm. out of salmon quite often because it's just like such a rich uh, energy uh, source overall. But yeah, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that, to that question. We did have um, one more question that we'll, we'll try to get to here, um, Brooklyn. Uh, Randy was ask, was asking, do many salmon make it to the top of the falls? Um, you know, he sees them jumping near where the old fish ladder is. Um, and mm -hmm. that's really hard to see on the cameras, but on the near side of the cameras, where the waterfall comes down, there's a, the kind of like a little channel just right in front of that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a fish ladder that's no longer passable to salmon. But yeah. Randy is wondering about, you know, do, do salmon actually, you know, make it up the falls? It's it's, it's kind of hard to see on the cameras. It can be difficult to see. Um, we do, um, when we are stationed as rangers on the false platform, one of our duties is to take an hourly fish count. And so we will stand there and we'll take a 60 second timer and we will count um, as close as we can to about how many salmon we're seeing successfully make it to, um, and jump the falls. And so that gives us a good idea, um, a general perspective of the kind of numbers that we may um, be seeing, but it can be as high as 40% um, successfully making it. It depends on how many salmon are jumping at once, if we've got bears that are an obstacle. Um, and we've talked about before when we have a high density um, push of salmon, you know, that sometimes will actually give more opportunity for the salmon to jump as bears are easily able to get their fill from the river and move out of the way. Um, and so salmon do make it uh, and they are successful, but it's important to note that, um, you know, the obstacles that they face along the river are really testing how healthy those salmon are. And so the obstacles that they have to get through are going to help narrow down um, to really make sure that the healthiest salmons are the ones that are making their way up the river into those natal spawning grounds. Um, so even though the falls may feel like an unfair obstacle that they have to get over, it really is making sure that the salmon populations are going to remain um, as healthy as they can be and not just let, you know, lazy Joe salmon make their way into the, into the spawning grounds. And that's that's one reason why the fish ladder is is no longer passable to salmon and, and no longer maintained in that manner is to help again uh, diversify diversify the genetics of of that population overall because um, historically salmon made it up over Brooks Falls all all on their own they didn't need the the help of the fi of the fish ladder uh, and the salmon that spawn downstream Brooklyn I, I know you've spoken about this before in one of our chats um, they're not necessarily like genetically inferior um, but they, they most of those fish that spawn downstream are the one that's where they were born so that's where they've chosen to spawn but I do think there's occasionally some fish that just don't make it I think they'll keep on trying and trying and trying and trying and just until they get eaten or their energy is is really exhausted but most of those salmon that want to make it you know they have it in their genes to make it up over the falls because that's where they were born. That's how their parents got there. And those just genes get um, passed on from generation to generation. It's a really fascinating uh, process to watch. And the falls itself is not short. I mean, it's like it's like a six to seven foot high uh, leap right there. So they, they have to have a lot of energy um, and endurance to make that. And they're doing that all without eating. They don't eat in fresh water at all. Yeah. But I think that's uh, all for our questions that we have right now. If you have more questions for us um, in the future that you want to try to uh, submit to us in advance, please use the Ask Your Bear Cam question uh, link that's found in the More Info tab down below the live camera page. We'll be happy to try to get to those as much as possible. Our next live event is tomorrow when I am joined by Ranger Naomi, and we'll be talking about bear fishing styles. So tangential to salmon, um, but we're going to talk about how bears make a living at Brooks Falls and how they do it in different ways. Brooklyn, it was so great to talk with you today, and I'm glad you're you're here to share your knowledge and passion with salmon, or about salmon with everybody. Yeah, thank you so much again for having me. And my name is Mike Pitts with Explore.org. Thanks for joining me today, and never stop learning.